Thank you again. <clears throat> it's great to be back in my favorite city, uh, Chennai. I remember the first time when Dr. Balakrishnan invited me to visit. I didn't realize that Chennai had such rich culture, especially for me. And, I had a, and it was a very impactful visit. I'm really happy to be back among friends and among great places. Uh, I got a question last night uh, from some of you because, you know, usually Asians bow. And I know you're Asian, but you probably don't have a bowing culture. So I just wanted to make it straight. When you see a person bow, 15 degrees is just a hello bow. Like in the U.S., it's like high five. And when you don't know that person very well, but you feel you need to be respectful, then it's around a 30 degrees bow. And if you really respect the person like your mentors or your seniors, then you get a 45 degree bow. Like I was bowing, Raja, 45 degrees. <laughs> So, so next time when you see a person bowing, then you realize, ah, okay, how much respect he has for me. A 90 degree bow, you should not do. More is not better. 90 degrees is an apology bow. So when I make my rounds in the morning, I go and I see my residents, and when, make, when they make a 90 degree bow, I know my flap is dead. So, Today I've been, uh, I want to share my journey of what I think was an innovation and I'm really happy to do that and I really want to thank my friend Dr. Skandra so, for inviting me to come to Chennai and I hope he's out there somewhere uh, because this part of this lecture is also for him who's uh, really made my journey to Chennai come possible. You know, when we talk about innovation, we always talk about innovation and, 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 and like today during the session um, on the fourth dimension, a lot of the talks was on innovation. And I remember one of the speakers saying, innovation is not doing really something new. It's about finding what is out there and sort of making it better, putting it together. And that's what innovation is all about. And if you think about it, innovation is always based on what we learn from our mentors. You have one of the greatest innovators, the father of plastic surgery in India, and then you have great innovators of modern time. And this is why I, I respect Raja, Dr. Balakrishnan, Dr. Reddy, who I've seen their work, and in a way innovated me to do better and to build on further. And this is why innovation should be always and will always be built on shoulders of giants. And for those who are part of the Tamil Nadu family, you are so lucky because you have so many innovating seniors out there. And if you look at what they have in common is that they're trying to do something different. They're trying to do something new. And most of all, they're trying to do something better. And through that process, because of their abundant experience, it seems easy that it allows you to also go ahead and try to innovate. And that's what plastic surgery is all about. And we've seen so many great innovations in our field. And we even do now facial transplant. But what the core in this innovation is not only about saving lives. It's about giving a life, giving a life of hope, giving a life that allows to be normal, that we take it for granted. But for the people who are out there, their dream is to become normal and have a normal life. And we, through innovation, allows us to give that to them. Innovators work hard. They persevere. They dedicate and they're passionate. They make hard decisions. And of course, they sacrifice a lot. Nothing ever comes easy. And this is not built over a day, like Rome was not built over a day. It takes time. And for those young people, they say, oh, I want to start innovating. That doesn't happen overnight. Your time will come. You just have to persevere and really work hard during your time because it's all about your perspiration. It's not about the sudden idea that you have during a night. You know, as doctors, young doctors who goes into med school, you all have talent. You're probably the 0.01% of the Indian population. If you go to med school, you all have talent talent. You have incredible talent. But if you don't put effort and build skill, 
And if you further don't put effort after training and building skills, you'll never accomplish, you'll never have the achievement that will change the face of your practice and the world. And even though, for those young people who are in training or in fellowship, your daily routine may seem like I'm doing things over and over and over again. You know what? That is what leads to excellence because it's about the practice. It's about building your experiment, experience. It's about being practical, learning to be practical. It's about persisting. It's about finding perfection. And sometimes it's about being a little bit of paranoid as well because this all in due time, in your training, in your fellowship. That's the formula to lead to excellence. You know the story about the pilot who was hit by a bird in the engine and, and he had a sudden failure. And either he could do crash landing, but he chose to land in the river and save everybody. This kind of sudden impulse decision doesn't come overnight. This, this pilot had tens and tens of thousands of hours of flight. And that's what gives us the training. It gives us the power to suddenly come out and have an incredible solution. And at that moment, after days and days of training, gives you the opportunity to think beyond the box. And that's something that you put into practice because of restraint, because of time, because of sudden need, that is the pathway. And that is only given by your training. So your training is not only about acquiring knowledge. It's not only about acquiring skills. It's about learning and building an attitude. It's about building character, like Raja said. And that needs to be your training. And that leads to being prevalent. So even though your daily life, your junior faculty, your, 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 your resident, it may look very mundane, it may look very boring, one day you realize that because you have this strong foundation, you'll be slowly, slowly growing and then having the capability to see beyond the box and to really think about innovation. Oh, JP! then why doesn't everybody innovate in our field? Because it, may, it demands change. To innovate means to do something different. To do something different, it means to change. But you know what? Let's face the truth. Change is very uncomfortable. It keeps me anxious. Sometimes change is lonely. And most of all, change requires a lot of courage, overcoming fear. And we don't like to do that. We don't like to do that. And I don't blame you. I don't blame you for not doing that. Because we like to do what works. And whenever something works, we feel very comfortable. And that allows us not to get out of our comfort zone. And I don't blame you at all. Because unfortunately, in our education system, especially when you go to med school, we're taught what works. We are, to, we are taught to memorize the past. We are taught that we are great. We are great people. We are doctors. We are taught that we are smart. We are taught to feel bad when we are criticized. And when you do something wrong, we even see people blaming others. That's our culture. That's the culture of medicine. And because we have this culture, we build up so much fear in changing. And that is why it is so difficult to get out of that comfort zone. And this is why there are not many innovators, unfortunately, in our field. But you must jump. You must take a leap, knowing that you might fail, knowing that you might be alone, knowing that it's going to be fearful, knowing that we don't know what's going to happen, but without taking a jump you'll never lead to innovation and to change the face of your practice. If you look at innovators around you, they say, well, let's do it. We can do it. Yeah, sometimes we fail, but we'll persevere. We'll learn. I want to change. I want the difficult cases. 
oh, this difficult case. No, 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 send it to the junior. No, I want to do it. I want to learn from it. I know I can fail. And if somebody criticizes me, okay. What do I not know? Why is he saying these things? And they want to learn. They want to open their mind. And this is what growing people have in common. And this is what innovators have in common. They want to grow. They want to grow until the day that they die. Because without growth, without challenge, sometimes life can be meaningless. And this is well written by a, 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 a book called Mindset by Carl Dweck. So today, I want to share you my journey of how I overcame that fear, how I began to think openly, and how that has changed my practice. And the first thing you must do always is ask why. You must challenge the dogma. You must challenge the status quo. Because without asking why, you'll never change. Remember, for those who have kids, for those who are kids, what do they say? Oh, daddy, why does the moon change shape? Dad, why does the bird fly? We ask so many questions. But once you go to high school, junior high, elementary, med school, we stop asking questions. We lose that drive to have answers for our curiosity. We are all once children, and we forget being a children and what it feels like learning about things that we don't know. You have to ask why. Sometimes there will be answers. There's millions of literatures out there, but if there's no answers, then you must do the research. If there's no answers, do the research. Hey, I'm pretty sure somebody asked a similar question, but they may have asked four decades ago. Now with better technology, better thinking, maybe the answer could be different. What is the history? Where is the evidence? What are the data? How can we do it better? That's the research. And if there's nobody who's asking that question, then make a hypothesis. Hypothesis. And prove your hypothesis. Because today, in a fast-changing world of technology, ideas, skills, AI, robotics, you'll always find a better way. There's always a better way. You just have to find it. It is our job. And once you make a hypothesis, go to your mentors, talk about your idea, validate your idea, accept criticism, make your hypothesis stronger, share and communicate. That is the way to do it. This is where mentors are so great. Sometimes I ask Raja, what do you think about this idea? But for me, I have a mentor who's been great along all my path. And they not only validate your ideas, they set you in a path, path that you don't know that you had. For those who don't know my story, after residency, when I started to do free flaps under my name, I don't know why, but three consecutive free flaps failed. They died completely. I was a wreck. And I told my professor, Professor Chung, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to change my specialty to cranial maxillofacial. And he goes, okay, you could do that. Let's go drinking. So he took me out to a drink, and then suddenly he whacked my head on the back. Bow! He said, you're not going to become a true microsurgeon until you kill 100 flaps. Keep on killing. And I learned from my mistakes. According to his definition, I'm still not a true microsurgeon. I haven't killed 100 yet. But anyway, your mentors are there to give you encouragement, to validate your ideas and go talk to your mentors. And if your mentors are not at your institution, then search your city, your country, travel. You'll be amazed at how many people are willing to help you. And for those young people who are living in the world of web, we have Facebook, Twitter, we have Instagram. And I get this kind of question a lot from people that I don't know and I try to answer as much as possible. I think this is one of, the, uh, one of the surgeons from India. And I'll try to answer as much as possible. I just have to stay at the toilet a long time. But anyway, you know, the world can be your teacher. 
only if you seek it. So seek out. Send a message. Send an email. Knock on the doors of your mentors. Knock on the doors of the senior professors in your country. Ask for help. Ask for validation. And you know what? A lot of the times, they'll be more than happy to help you, to guide you, to share your idea. Most of all, to criticize your idea and make it better. And once you have a hypothesis, and once you validate a hypothesis, you finally have to put it into practice. Because without doing, there is no innovation. As plastic surgeons, we think about many great things all the time. Wow. But if you don't execute it, if you don't do it, it never becomes an innovation. I had that idea. So what? You didn't publish it. You didn't implement it. Anybody can have an idea, but not everybody has recognition for the innovation that they did. Can we play the video? Ah. Do you nothing that I say? Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. That's right. So one of the things that I make my residents promise to me on the first day of their work is, you know, there's three things that you shouldn't do. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't say, I'll try. You must say, I do. And first of all, don't procrastinate. Do it immediately when you think about it. And that is the way. And as you do it, as you implement new ideas, as you're doing new flaps, you will fail. Everybody fails. If they said, I never fail, it's because they didn't do enough. Or maybe they're really good. I fail. And the moment you fail, if you say, oh, I don't want to do this microsurgery again, then that's when you really fail. Because you'll never find out if you could have been great. You'll never find out if I could have done better. So embrace failure. Because if you learn from failure, that is not a failure. Heeded my words not, did you? Pass on what you have learned. Strength, mastery, but weakness, folly, failure also. Yes, failure, most. You know, when I see Yoda, it always... The greatest teacher failure is. The greatest teacher failure is. You know, when I see Yoda, it reminds me a lot of India, you know? You have a lot of wise men here. So, so you know, Yoda has been sort of my mental mentor for a long time, and he, he says the same thing. It's incredible. For those young kids who haven't seen Star Wars, please take a look at it. Anyway, as Yoda says, failure is the greatest teacher. And as you fail, you learn from it, you evolve from it, you improve from it, and you learn how to overcome. Young kids nowadays, they have everything they want. They never experience failure. They never experience how to overcome. And because you go through this failure, the most important thing is that you grow. You grow to be better. You grow to be a better person. So, four steps of how I implemented innovation is first, always ask why. Challenge the status quo. And then, if there is no answer, do the research. Find the answer. And if there's no answer, make a hypothesis. Validate your hypothesis through communication. And if your hypothesis is good enough, then you do it. That is the way to have a mindset for innovation. My first journey in lower limb reconstruction started with the anterolateral thigh. And I think most of you know and back in 1999, I was one of the first ones to do ALT in Seoul. And of course, I learned it from our good mentor, Dr. Fu Chan Wei. And for a long time, I really thought that ALT was the answer for everything. And this is until I did 2,500 flaps. And as I was doing ALT, I was asking myself, is there a way to make the dissection easier? 
And I realized that Bovi has a really good character of coagulation and also dissecting. So I asked my mentor, hey, why don't we use a Bovi to dissect? And he said, no, you should not. We know that it causes more damage to the pedicles, to the vessels. And I said, really? And I did the research. Zero evidence, zero paper on whether or not monopolar is worse than bipolar or compared to the cutting mode. So what do we do? So I said, okay, let's make an animal study. We compare the cutting mode of the monopolar to the bipolar and to the scissors. It turns out radiation, the constriction of the vessel is not worse than bipolar. Monopolar on cutting mode is almost same in non-radiating heat as the scissors. Incredible, isn't it? We even looked at the electron microscope. Bipolar actually causes more damage. Really, really incredible. We published this work. And now what do I do? I always dissect using monopolar bovi, especially the intermuscular portion. Look at that, zero bleeding. It coagulates, it cuts, it dissects. And I showed my professor, hey. And he said, wow, that's good. You found the evidence, implement it. And this is how we do our dissection now. And this is how we're able to do rapid dissection. I don't know if Dr. Reddy does it the same way, but the monopolar and cutting mode has been a pivotal instrument in, wrapping, in elevating our flaps less than an hour. So, you may choose to do what you're told. You may choose not to take risk, but if you do, you'll never know if something better is out there, like the Icarus book. And for a long time, as I was doing ALT, I said, wow, this is the ideal flap. And sometimes, you know, ALT can be a super thick hamburger. So I asked myself, hey, is there a way that we could make this flap thinner other than trying to find thin patients? And it turns out that there's actually multiple layers of elevation that we can do. Before, we were taught just two layers, sub-defascial, sub-fascial elevation, or supra, above the defascial elevation. There was just two layers. And if you look at the anatomy really, really carefully, you see that there's two distinctive fat layers, the superficial fat and the deep fat. And I said, wow, look at the thickness of this deep fat. If we get rid of this, maybe we can elevate a thinner flap. And thus, we identified the layer of the superficial fascia and shown that it was very safe to elevate in this new plane. And what has this led to? Now it has led to elevating not only in deep fascia, not only subfascial, not only superficial fascia, which is called the super thin, in between the superficial fat, which is called the ultra thin, and now we're doing pure skin flap. So no fat. That is the evolution from asking why. Can we make it thinner? Finding the evidence, finding the key. And now we're able to elevate thin ALT flaps. Yeah, but you know what? The ALT still has an ugly donor site. Is there a place we could have a more better donor site? That was my next question. And I said, let's revisit the groin. And everybody knows the groin flap. And Dr. Aizawa Koshima showed that it could be elevated on puff raters. So he said, okay, let's try to do that, but let's raise it thin enough using these multiple thin layers. And we're able to find an ideal donor site. And as we were struggling with the vascularity of the skip flap, we identified two clear anatomy, one on the medial puff rater, one on the lateral puff rater. We even identified there's an axial pattern puff rater in half of the cases, while half of the cases have an anchoring type. And this is why sometimes it may seem very variable and unreliable. But understanding these kind of anatomy has really led us to understand each branch's character, especially the superficial fascia, and allowed us to maximize the use of the skip flap, and now, which is one of the key elements in elevating a thin flap in our body. And I love the skip flap. But you know, there's no such a thing as an ideal flap. If something's good, always something, it's a trade-off. Something is bad. In the case of the skip flap, it was beautiful, thin, excellent donor site, but the pedicle was always short. 
So I asked, how can we solve this problem of the short pedicle? And then I asked myself, hey, look, if we can elevate a 30 by 15 flap on a single perforator, why not use this perforator as a recipient? And hence the idea of the perforator, perforator supermicrosurgery. And we've been doing that and not looking back and introduced the concept of perforator, perforator, minimal invasive surgery throughout our body. Our body has more than 450 perforators. We don't have to look for a major vessel. If you find the perforator, that's enough. And that is the concept of minimal invasive surgery. And, we, and I, as I was doing lower extremity, I also realized that splinting is also very important. There's no such a thing as a neutral position when it comes to pedicle. If you, if you dorsiflex the leg, then you have better anterior, anterior tibial artery flow. If you plantar flex the foot, then you have better posterior tibial flow. And this was contrary to the concept of maintaining a functional position. So in the concept of flap survival, this really led us to understand how to increase the flap survival. What about dangling? Lower extremity reconstruction, everybody dangles. Where's the evidence of dangling? There is no good evidence. So we asked, why do we dangle? Why do we waste two weeks of dangling? Because once you start the patient walking and putting their leg, the gravity pulls into the flap. And because the gravity pulls, it causes congestion. And if that's too severe, you might have a flap loss. So I asked, okay, then how can we prevent the flap from pulling? And hence the idea of early compression. So now after two days, we start compression. Ah, the next question is, okay, if this prevents pulling, and if the flap is still good, what is the limit of compression? How do you measure compression? And we started to toy with ultrasound, using the ultrasound to measure velocity and, trans and then translating into pressure. So we found out that 35 to 45 millimeter mercury pressure does not hinder the effect of the vascular flow in the foot or the leg. Wow, okay, so let's start compression two days later, around 35 to 45 millimeter mercury. Zero incidence of failure, unless you have an ischemic diabetic foot or ischemic limb. And as we were toying with ultrasound, we said, wow, this physiology looks interesting. Did you know that when you rotate a, flap, uh, a propeller flap 180 degrees, clockwise rotation, counterclockwise rotation, the flow velocity is significantly different? There is a concept of favorable rotation. And now we're able to prevent marginal necrosis by using ultrasound to measure the directionality which has a better flow after 180 degrees rotation. That's amazing stuff. We always thought that 180 degrees was always the same. But now with evidence, we show that it is different. And while we were using ultrasound, we started mapping, preparing the flaps, knowing exactly where the perforators were. The design was simple. We just go straight, cut all the other perforators, elevate, done. And then we asked another question. Can we actually see lymphatic valves or lymphatic vessels with the ultrasound? Answer, yes. But it was very difficult because the megahertz was not high enough. The resolution was not high enough. And then some on industry heard about us doing research in lymphatic vessels. They came to us and said, hey, look, we got a new machine. You want to do the research? Yeah, let's do it. And now we're able to have 33 megahertz, 70 ultra high frequency ultrasound to actually know whether or not this lymphatics is functioning, period. We don't have to use anything else. Now we're able to map out. And that has changed the practice of lymphedema. Knowing what works, knowing what lymphatics are degenerated or not, it has changed the idea of doing chronic lymphedema patients, having the hope to provide a physiological functional resolution combined with debulking, of course. And this has really revolutionized the way we do lymphedema by imaging 
And as we were practicing with ultrasound, understanding the physiologic aspect of the flow, we started to do ischemic diabetic foot and determined that any perforator with a 15 centimeters per sec or higher will be able to hook up a flap. And then we started to do ischemic diabetic foot and limb salvage. And it was a, another incredible journey in super microsurgery. And a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, look, not many people can do the idea of small vessel surgery, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Is there a way we can do it better? We keep asking. And of course there's a way. A robotic, com a robotic com company comes to us and say, hey, look, let's try to make a super microsurgery robot. And we did. It's in the market in Europe now. It's in the market in some parts of Asia, and FDA is being cleared this month. Idea. Let's say, ah, oh, super microsurgery works. We can do it. How can we make it easier? Now introducing the super microsurgery robot. And you know what? The journey doesn't end there. Did you know that dementia occurs because of lymphatic obstruction in the brain? We've known this since 2012. And now we're thinking about doing LVA in the neck to allow better flow to improve dementia. Wow, I'm a plastic surgeon and I'm doing dementia now. You see how this journey takes you? It will take you to incredible areas of engineering of the future. Hopefully we'll be able to provide solutions to dementia and I will not be dependent on my wife so much now. But anyway, this is the future. Keep on asking questions. And as going back to the leg, and as we're doing ischemic diabetic foot, we sometimes ended up doing amputation. And for a long time, as a plastic surgeon, I said, amputation is the, the, is the worst. We should avoid amputation at all costs. However, amputation does, ha does happen. And I said, okay, is there a way to help do better amputation? And I learned this from Dr. Adinger. Look at this, as plastic surgeons, we have the capability to do fibula strut flaps to stabilize the distal amputation part of the fibula and the tibia, minimize torque, and have a more stable amputation. That's the role of a plastic surgeon in amputation. In amputation, a lot of patients suffer from pain, residual limb pain, neuroma pain, phantom pain, and this is a nightmare for the patients that undergoes amputation. Okay, as a plastic surgeon, is there a way we could do this better? Is there a way we could improve this? And yes, nerve surgeons like Paul Siderna, Dr. Adinger, and Jason Cole Dumanian from Chicago, they found the way to manipulate nerves and do targeted, reinnovated, targeted TMRs and then put a, uh, put a muscle graft over the nerve terminal, creating a new terminal called RPNI. And this is basically, what is this? It is, it is allowing the nerve to do something. And thus, it has reduced pain in 71% with RPNI and 72% after TMRs. And this is what we're doing routinely whenever we need to amputate. We're doing fibula struts, we're doing peripheral nerve um, surgery to minimize these kind of pain. But in reality, what are we creating? We are creating a new terminal, a new mus muscle nerve terminal. And what has that led us to? It has led us to cybernetics. Finding that new terminal, allowing the amplitude of the nerve to maximize, hooking it up with wires. Now we're truly living in the age of cyborg. Now these patients can control their limb with their thoughts and maximizing the nerve potential through TMRs and RPNIs. We're living in a world of cyber cybernetics. Incredible journey. Just by doing free flaps, ALT, 1990, 1999, 2024, now heading the cybernetics, heading the dementia, heading the robotics, heading the peripheral nerve, 
heading the ischemic limb, lymphedema, all the things that we're taught it was impossible, is now possible, as Raja said, as Dr. Auckland said. It all begins by asking why. So ask yourself, where is your future? It all starts by asking why. Why does that happen? Why do we not try? Challenge the status quo. And if you don't find the answer, do the research. Build a hypothesis. Validate your idea through communication with mentors, friends. Welcome criticism. Build your hypothesis stronger. And you finally implement it. And through that course, you will have failure. Embrace failure. Don't be afraid to talk about it. And this is why I love your meeting. I think your meeting is one of the rare meetings where failure is celebrated rather than criticized. Failure is brought out there courageously. And people are trying to learn from what they have failed. So hope that I will fail less. And this is the way to innovation. And yes, it's difficult. It's difficult to make change, but don't just do it once. Once you start making this change every day, what does it become? It becomes a habit. And once you have this habit, you go running every morning, it becomes a behavior. And behavior defines character. The fourth dimension of what Raja says, character. That defines you as an innovative person who is not afraid to change and maintain change, embrace change, and ultimately this. Can you play that video? And this, hopefully, Darn, it's not working. Anyway, we are the champions, my friend. This was the song. <laughs> and, and I give you this final slide. I give you this final slide. There are three types of people out there who makes it happen, becomes a champion, who just watches it happen, and finally, who doesn't know what the hell happened. So it's up to you where you want to take your journey as a plastic surgeon. Being a plastic surgeon is just getting the right tools for your future, for your journey. And I hope to see many more of you make it happen and to come back and to learn from you of the next innovations that is going to be coming out from your brain that will change the face of how we practice plastic surgery tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hong. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> yes. With due great respect. 45 degrees. 45 degrees, yeah. Thank you. So what he has given us today is direction. You have given us a direction. Those who are starting out, a direction to move. For those who are already moving, to confirm whether you're going in the right direction. And for those who are going in the wrong direction, to change it. So a positive lecture, a very positive lecture, you. you've achieved everything we wanted. We wanted you to talk about. Thank you so much. I think we need to give another round of applause to Dr. J.P. Hong. A standing ovation would be better. <laughs>